Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth edition of the, the Care Advantage webinar series, uh, which is a collaboration between Carers New South Wales uh, and TAFE New South Wales. Um, so my name is Alex, for those of you who haven't uh, met me, I'm the Project Officer at Carers New South Wales on the Care to Work project. So our topic uh, for today is culture as your asset. So we'll be looking at some of the, the different ways in which culture and identity can shape a meaningful career. So first, before I begin today's session, uh, I'd first like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I am situated, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to extend my respects to the traditional custodians of the land across the many different locations where we meet in this virtual space this morning. So we're really excited to be shining a light on Aboriginal culture this morning and the topic of culture more broadly. So our carer in profile uh, today, she'll be first up, is Aboriginal woman and former carer Shana Owen from Bernardos, Australia. Uh, she'll be sharing some of her inspirational journey of how caring and culture has influenced her career and her study aspirations. So following on from Shana, we'll have um, Rachel Matheson, who's the project, um, sorry, the program manager of care of the Carers and Employers Network at Carers New South Wales. So Rachel will be providing a bit of an introduction to her program, as well as some valuable insights into how to recognise carer-friendly workplace culture and some key things to, to look out for regarding this. So I will now try to um, start the interview with Shana, leader on the Mount Druitt project. Um, so thank you so much, Shana, for, for uh, joining us today on the Carer Advantage uh, to share a little bit about your journey as a carer and your valuable experience of juggling work and care. Okay, so over to you. So hi, Alex, and um, hi, everybody else. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to um, speak about um, my experience. Um, so to give you a bit of an idea of, of um, I guess, who I am. So obviously my name is Shana um, and I am a team leader for Bernardo's Australia um, and I work in um, the Mount Druitt project specifically and, and another youth team. Um, I uh, am currently not no longer caring. Um, I'm a bereaved parent um, and some of my um, conversation today will, will probably focus a little bit more on returning to work after um, caring, um, although I, I did uh, do a couple of things um, whilst caring for my daughter. Um, so yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Shana. So, um, so we've got a question. What is it? What does a day in your work role look like currently? So, what is yeah day in the life of Shana? <laughs> you have uh, other children, so <laughs> so I um, have the I guess responsibilities that uh, all parents have. Um, I um, so I go to work. I, I'm a team leader, so um, I, I look after a team of. Um, or, or two different teams in a youth in two different sort of youth programs, one in Penrith and uh, one in Mount Druitt. Um, and we look at, um, I guess, what we can do to support both uh, communities, young people in those communities and their families. And we provide um, a, a range of different support to the community. Um, and, and I um, am involved in, in all of that with my team. Um, so, so yeah, I also study as well. So um, I'm studying biomed subjects. Um, it's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. Can you tell so, us a little bit about um, the biomed subjects and, and um, you know, the way that relates to your employment goals, your future goals, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. So I'm studying biomed subjects. Um, because um, after uh, my care experience, I um, found I had a uh, passion for medicine and helping others in um, that particular uh, work. Um, and so I took on a, a couple of uh, biomed subjects 
uh, at a term and um, I would like to apply to med school this year. Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'd like to be a doctor. Um, I think I'm probably heading towards more of um, palliative care um, as a specialty if um, that's where I'm found to, I guess, be best suited um, as I study in the future. Mm. So absolutely. Well, the next question is, it was around, you know, how how your caring experience has influenced your work goals, and I think that's, you know, very clear for you that it's that it's it's heavily influenced where you're heading, and um, in in both, um, you know, the, the passion that you now have to engage, um, as well as the the practical experience in so many ways. I can imagine. That yeah. And, and what about sort of before, um, you know, um, if we could just take you back a little bit, your journey to, to where you are now um, in regards yeah. to work and, and your caring? Yeah, yeah. So, look, um, I cared for my terminally ill uh, daughter. She was born with a genetic um, condition. So um, not long after birth, it became pretty evident that I wasn't going to have capacity to work as I normally had um, because her needs were very complex. So I made a decision to stay at home with her. So I had always worked in the community sector prior to having Dolly. Um, so I spent uh, the first couple of years of her life uh, looking at different ways in which I could I guess generate income because I wanted to become a little bit more independent of I guess, government departments or welfare organisations, um, you know, NDIS kind of saying this is, what you, this is what you're entitled to based what I think, what I thought my daughter needed. Um, so some of the things I did during uh, my daughter's life was I started a little at-home business. Um, I made candles. I um, sold... Um, children's goods, um, like clothing, um, I made nappy cakes. I just did things that um, I could, that could work around her rather than her having to work around any sort of career that I chose. I also studied online during her life. Um, so the, the biomed subjects that I was studying, I actually started studying um, prior to us um, to, to um, her growing her wings as well. So um, I've been studying biomed subjects now for about, I'd say about three years, um, just little subjects here and there as I could handle. I think it's a bit of a challenge as a carer trying to um, take on um, any type of formal education or um, work, but it is doable you just may have to be a bit more sort of realistic about how you do it um, so you don't become overwhelmed. Um, look, I did the job that I'm currently in. Um, I applied for that prior to um, uh, Dolly growing her wings as well. Um, and I was looking at returning to work a couple of days a week um, during her life um, so I could better support her. Um, it just happened that um, between applying for the job and actually going for the interview, um, we actually lost her. So it, it didn't, I guess it, it didn't work out the way I had thought it was going to, but I was looking at um, how I could provide for her. Um, and like I said, I was pretty determined to become a little bit independent of NDIS um, sort of dictating to me what she could have and couldn't have and um, I was going to make sure she had whatever I thought she needed. Um, so wanting to go to work. So conversations with NDIS around what um, care after school would potentially look like um, and, and holiday care and um, just things like that were starting to take place. Um, and it is it, it would have been doable, but... Um, 
there was never an intention to return to full-time work during her life because I felt that caring was a full-time job within itself. Um, and so if I was to return to work, I, would, I was going to do it in a way that wouldn't impact too much on her needs um, or, or even my own self-care. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that, Shana. Yeah. So um, we have a question around um, your Aboriginality. So, so really um, interested in how your Aboriginality has influenced your work life and how important it is to your work, um, that your work benefits the Aboriginal community ongoing. Yeah, yeah. So um, Aboriginal woman um, and, and known and accepted in the Mount Druitt community have grown up um, in the Mount Druitt community um, as a team leader um, or a community worker. Um, it's always um, a part of the work that I do in respects to um, working directly with my community. I really enjoy it as well. Um, and I want to um, see, thing, see the community grow and, and benefit from anything that I do, um, my community and, and then the wider community as well. Um, I think Aboriginal people um, are usually quite, um, especially when we go into um, the human services in any sort of role, we're, we're very passionate about um, working directly with our community and supporting our community to facilitate um, any type of change that's going to better um, their lives um, and also I guess another part of it is um, you know advocating for our community or educating people um, the wider community about our culture and who we are and um, and making sure that decisions that are made are culturally appropriate for our, our children and young people and, and our families um, so yeah it's, it's a huge part of um, who I am and it wouldn't it's not going to really um, matter what role I'm in like if I was to stay in the community sector I would continue to work in the fashion that I do um, with my community and involving them and, and um, uh, encouraging I guess um, members of the community to grow and develop or have a say in what happens with specific projects and things that I'm working on um, which is more informing the wider community about what I'm doing so they're aware of what's impacting um, or what's, uh, what potentially their families are becoming involved in. Um, and then if I work in medicine, I'll continue to support my community in, in that field as well. I guess sometimes I think about, um, you know, if I was a doctor, like working with my own community in that space as well and what that would look like. Um, it's definitely something I'm interested in. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can hear that. And it's just such a valuable role that you're playing um, and have been, you know, bridging that gap between community and services. It's it's just so valuable. And to see, you know, all that you've all that you've done and for that to move into into a role as, as a doctor in the field, that's just so exciting. Thank you. <laughs> so um, just to bring back around, um, I guess, for the, for the audience, um, around lessons learnt as a working carer, it sounds like you've gone through a huge journey um, and and a, a big part of that was, was in Dolly's life um, when you were a, an active carer. Um, so I guess more around, um, yeah, and you've already explained a little about the things that you, you did, you've touched on it. Um, yeah, yeah. so I guess, yeah, yeah. And then, and then as a ongoing, um, lessons as uh, juggling a lot of parenting and, you know, a lot of other things, you've got a lot to offer. Yeah. yeah. Look, I think, um, lessons that I learned as a carer is, um, <laughs> okay, um, I've, I've learnt, um, and I know that we're talking about the experience of care, but um, this is something that I've learnt by watching, like coming through it and then watching others yes. who, are, who are still caring. Mm -hmm. um, I've learnt at the time when you are caring, it's 
overwhelming and stressful, I guess. Um, and I think that um, carers are very hard on themselves in that in that space. Um, but when you're on the outside and you're looking at other people doing it, you quite um, it can be quite shocking to see the amount of work that someone is doing in caring for somebody, um, and that you know. And when I say shocking, I don't mean in a bad way. I mean like it's you don't realise when you're doing it how much you're that actually. Level. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that that's something that I've um, definitely learnt that you know it's hard work, um, and then it leads into the other part that. Um, I've learned as well and, and that's around um, self-care as well. Um, I don't think carers are very good at taking care of themselves. So when you're looking at, you know, ed, like furthering your education or, um, you know, looking at ways to, I guess, um, develop a little bit of independence through returning to work um, or generating an income of any sort, I think... Um, you know, to be fair on, on yourself when you're looking at what you're, you're taking on um, and be a bit realistic as well about, you know, um, your capacity to do certain things. So um, recognising that um, care is, is, like I'd previously said, it's a full-time job within itself. Yeah. So, you know, when you're looking, if you're looking at furthering your education, you may not, and you're still in the midst of caring for someone, um, you may not be able to take it on in a full-time capacity, but it doesn't mean that you can't move forward um, or choose to study something or, or look at sort of at-home business or even part-time work. It just means, um, you know, that when you're planning on, on taking those steps, that also take into consideration that, um, you know, that, it is a big job, that self-care is important mm -hmm. um, and that, um, you know, that you need to juggle all those things well. Um, and, you know, if you have a crack, I guess, at something and it is too much or it's not for you, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you're, you're either a, not ready for it or, you know, re-examine what you've actually taken on and, and if that was a bit bit more than you had anticipated mm. and, and yeah, um, re-evaluate what, what you're actually doing and, and maybe look at other things. Um, and, you know, I think carers too can, um, we're naturally caring. <laughs> like it's I not just... So taking um, on things in that, you know, you're constantly caring and taking on more more things. Yeah, yeah, but also um, that's a skill set within itself as well that can be, I guess, transferred into another a line of work as well. So if you maybe don't have any previous um, skills or, or qualifications, you know, let's say a really young carer, um, just, you know, recognise that as well, that that, that those, the, the way in which you care for your loved one is actually something that can be transferred into some type of job um, further down the track. So would you potentially want to look at getting a certificate three or, or in something just to give you the qualification to be able to potentially do what you do now for your loved one as paid employment at a later date? Like there's, there's so much that you could do. Mm. Yeah. Mm. through that experience absolutely yeah. thank you and I really liked that you know that idea of trying things and you know until you get because often it is so all-consuming and, and you you know to give yourself that feedback of where you're at I think is 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 a really um good tip mm. oh yeah yeah and and um yeah you're, you're not going to know until you give it a go either so when I first mm started doing biomed subjects, I had um, studied a, um, at, at a university level before um, in community, the community sector, mm -hmm. and um, I took on three subjects in one hit and I thought, well, you know, if I could work full time and study before, then I can care for Dolly and I can study. And in actual fact, 
I was going in and out of hospital um, and I had to drop two of the subjects. So, um, and I was, I realised that, um, you know, I had to look at a way in which I could undertake the, um, the different units that I wanted to study and still care for her. So I decided at that point that um, rather than take too much on and potentially fail things, that mm-hmm. I would be better off studying one subject a term. Um, and so that's what I started doing. Um, and that worked much better because it, it just, um, you know, any type of study can be a, a bit of pressure at certain times with assessments and things like that. And I, yeah, and I didn't... I, I didn't need to have that extra pressure. It needed to be something that was um, an enjoyable space, I guess, because that was my space. Yes, yeah. As well, yeah. So, yeah, so then I re-looked at it and, like I said, took on one unit at a time rather than three um, because it didn't impact my capacity to to care for Dole mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Shana. Um, so, so I guess now just um, in regards to a role like yours, so um, for any carers out there who are seeking something in community, so you've already given a, a great sort of um, idea of some of their qualifications, um, how, yeah, I guess, and, 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 um, and also some of the lived experience that can be very, very valuable and how, how you know, combining these things is, is um, um, a good approach. Um, so, so any more tips um, in regards to a carer who might be seeking a role like yours currently, your current role? Yeah, yeah. Um, look, if, if there's any carers out there that are looking at the community sector as a um, career choice, um, I would say, um, you know, I guess it, it's an industry that's quite broad. Um, you're not, so at the moment I'm working with youth. Um, previously I've worked with um, children and, and families specifically. Um, but, you know, you can work in um, disabilities, drug and alcohol, um, there's a range of different services out there for, for women um, and there's um, not as many for men, but they are out there. Um, it's an industry that um, I guess unlike other industries, I think um, we're, we're a little bit more understanding, I think. So even um, if you're someone that is caring for someone and it, it is having a a little bit of an impact on on capacity there there could be flexibility i think it's probably more and it's more flexible than other um work uh, choices i think because um when you work in the community sector you're dealing with people's lives if that makes sense yes. so it, it, there's a bit more um i guess of a realistic approach yeah. um that life is uncertain and that, you know, yeah. that chaos exists and, and yeah. that's okay, yeah. And look, there's heaps, heaps of, like you could be a, a counsellor, you know, um, you might make a decision that, um, you know, through your care experience that you would like to support other carers um, and, and you could end up, you know, doing a, a diploma of some sort in, in counselling um yeah, so mental health is another field that you can... It's not... Um, yes, you can get certificates and diplomas and, and degree in, in a range of different subjects which would take you into the community sector, um, but it, it's so broad and, you know, you might try one and think that's that's not for me and, and you might make a decision to branch into another field. Um, I, look, I think initially I... Um, during whilst caring for Dolly, I had thought about counselling um, parents in particular, like doing yes. some sort of diploma in counselling um, to, on top of my um, other quals. But, um, you know, I've decided that I'd like to do medicine instead. But um, it's definitely um, a space. And, and, you know, I guess who better to understand maybe what a carer is going through than a carer themselves? Or someone 
caring experience. Mm-hmm. It just gives you a level of understanding that you would be able to bring into your work. Um, you know, you could become a caseworker and, and work with families who are caring for others. It's just, it's so broad. Like I couldn't. Yeah. And has it been your your experience, Shana, that you have, that it's been um, something you've always talked about um, when, so, so through, say, a job application process, um, was it apparent um, sort of in the written application as well as in your interviews, were you talking and being open around your caring experience? I'm, I'm interested in I did. Um, so as I said before, I had applied for this job um, prior to, to um, Dole going. Um, so in that application, I spoke, like the written application, I spoke to my experience in working with medical professionals, um, yes. working with um, professionals in an NDIS space, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I touched on that and I spoke about yeah. that personal experience I didn't Mm. go further into it because Mm. I felt that that conversation needed to be had at um during the interview if I made it uh, to an interview space um or or to to an interview um so yeah I did touch on it I started to Mm. touch on it because when you are caring for somebody you are essentially the carer is the the um primary contact so you, you're doing a lot of um essentially I used to feel like I was Dolly's caseworker in a yes, way <laughs> absolutely you're doing everything yeah. you're doing the house management and the personal care the whole round the clock yeah. management, as well as you know all the services and yeah it's incredible all needs uh, as well huge um and not everybody um, some people really struggle with that when they come into a care space needing to be um the advocate for their loved one as, as well. But as the time goes on, you sort of recognise that, you know, people may have decisions that you don't necessarily agree with that as in being the best choice for your loved one. So you you can get quite passionate about mm. what it is that you may think is the best. And and that's a skill as well. Um, so, yeah, all those, all those kind of things. Um, I had always had the intention of, um, <clears throat> sorry, having a conversation, like I said, during interview with, um, my potential in, in employer about um, what I was doing because I felt that that would um, impact at times my work and I felt I needed to be really transparent about that um, because people needed to make a decision that if I was the right fit for the job that, you know, that these are things that could be complicating factors mm-hmm. Um I guess I was really fortunate as well because um, when I was looking at um, my current my current job when when Doll was with us, they have um, a disabilities program actually in centre. Um, so it, yeah, it um, the intention I guess was that if I got the job that I would um, put Doll into their disabilities program on on like holiday program and stuff like that. So I could and you know. That was what I was um, told could potentially happen as well because I knew someone that was working there um, and they had said, look, you know, you should really apply for this job and, you know, this is, you know, what you can do with Dole during the holidays. And, and you know, even though she um, is no longer with me, it's been really nice to be around other kids who are special needs Um And, you know, the program itself is so lovely. I think that um, it would have, like, I would have been quite comfortable putting Dole um, into that holiday program if I was, um, if she was still with us, so I could still work and and do what I needed to do. Um, Yeah, I really, I've seen the way in which that program, holiday program works and, and I've seen the staff and it's really lovely. Like, it's just a really nice program and the kids are so beautiful. (laughs) <laughs> that's amazing yeah. and and that's yeah thank you for sharing that because it really does touch on just that the the level of research that you engage to you know prepare for um moving into workspace and how yeah. that would look um really you know so and also the the networking and the talking to people who are you know in in the programs that you 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 know you need to 
learn about for, for the person you're caring for. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think that it is, it's so much, there's so much involved, um, I think, for a carer to, to find the right fit for work. It really yeah. needs to be a few, you know, you, the understanding or meaningful work at least that's going to um, be sustainable and realistic. It's, it is so important that you have an under uh, work place and a, an employer that's understanding of your situation. And I think that that was something you, you know, thank you for explaining how, how you um, looked into that. Yeah, at first, and I think most carers, um, they don't um, think that they will be able to work or study or do anything. Um, but as, as time does go on, you, you do start to think, okay, well, now I can potentially, you know, um, look at making this work for me a little bit as well. Um, but that takes time as well. So if you've come into the caring role and, you, and you're at that space, it's just a lot of planning, but it's nothing that you're not used to. Mm, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're a professional it's, planner. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And and I'm just thinking one thing we haven't sort of um, touched on, but it obviously is in the background there, is, is drawing on support networks in your sort of personal sphere as well. Um, I'm sure absolutely. that's... Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and it's just having those conversations with people. I think look, there there are people who are willing to help and support, and it may not come in the way that um, we potentially would like it to at times. But um, you know, I think you know, draw on that stuff because people do want um, good things for for their you know their loved one as well who you're caring for. Mm -hmm. They also want to try and care for you a little bit. Um, mm -hmm as well and so it's just you know drawing on whatever support you can get to make it work for you um so during my course and stuff like that I managed to get um when Dol was, was here managed to get um some support so I could sit exams and things like that um so there is you know little things that can make a big difference that people may be able to offer that maybe you haven't thought about yet um yeah, so, you know, is that um, asking asking to for help as well? That learning to ask for for the support. Yeah, 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 and telling people, look, you know, I'm gonna, I don't know, do a course, or I'm thinking about returning to work, you know, two days a week or three days a week, or on a weekend, or you know, if I did that, what would you be able to help with? And sometimes people aren't going to be able to give you an answer, um, but you know, usually you might. Like I said, you might find someone who can support you sporadically um, and you can come to some sort of agreement about what that might look like even. Um, I think you just got to be open to, um, re, yeah, to, re, to ask for help and to receive it. And, and even, um, you know, and depending on who you are, you may be someone who's quite planned um, and you might be able to say, look, you know, or quite structured, um, if I return to work, could you do X? or A, B, C, you know, like, and, and be quite, um, set up a routine straight away with people and, and being able to speak directly to what exactly you're asking them for. Or it may just be, look, I don't know what kind of support I'm going to need, but if I did, you know, would you be there and, and what could you do? Um, mm. So, yeah, you know. Um, Living because, conversations. You know, mm. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, some courses are not as well are not... Um, if you were going to do study, are not um, just online forums like platforms. You'd have to go and do some face-to-face -face stuff. So yes. it depends what you want to do. Um, yeah, mm. yeah, and available, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic! Thank you so much for sharing with with us today, Shana. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Alex. That was great. What a high achiever. Yeah, it's an amazing story, isn't it? So what are you yeah. seeing right now, Michelle? Sorry, is it stop sharing? Uh, yeah, it's stop sharing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so when you're when you're ready, um, Rachel. Um, well, thank you. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Rachel Matheson. I'm the project manager at Carers and Employers. And before starting the session, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where I'm situated, which are the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation. I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and emerging and to extend my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which all participants in this event are located.
I'd also like to thank Shana for sharing her inspirational story. Gosh, Shana excludes humility and strength, and it was beautiful to hear how important culture and community are, especially in shaping her goals. So today's um, webinar is about culture as your asset, and I'm going to begin with an introduction about the Carers and Employers Program and how the project is working with organisations to encourage and recognise carer-friendly workplaces. So just to begin, um, a very brief, brief background um, and to give some context, um, Carers and Employers is a project of Carers New South Wales, which is funded by the New South Wales Government, the Department of Communities and Justice. And while based out of Carers uh, New South Wales, the program has the support of the network of carers associations throughout Australia. And that's important because it offers employers nationally the opportunity to be formally recognised as a carer friendly workplace by way of a national accreditation program. Um, so the program has established a best practice framework for supporting carers in the workplace. You can see there the accreditation program is comprised of three levels. Now, one of the aims of the project is to build a network of employers, um, diverse um, organisations, um, as well as offering the um, accreditation program. And for employers who do join the network and do become members, there are um, online resources that we make available to them, um, as well as webinars and seminars. And that's to help with um, helping to build capacity um, within those organisations and to give them the tools and resources to be able to build those carer friendly workplaces. Um, now, before I go on and discuss what's being done to develop carer friendly workplaces, I'll just briefly touch on some of the challenges and issues that arise for carers who juggle work and caring, and then we'll look at what workplaces um, can implement um, to help. So we heard um, Shana talk about some of these, um, and as you'd expect, these do vary from carer to carer, and um, I'm sure if we've got carers listening in here now, they've, they've probably got a lot more than we've, um, we've got time to show um, at the moment. Um, but just sort of briefly, some of the questions are, you know, how many hours of um, do I need to spend providing direct care? What are the crucial hours of the day I'm needed? What happens if paid care services aren't reliable and how will I manage emergencies? And so when organisations understand the pressures their employees may be encountering and indicate, and indicate where support can be found, um, as well as showing empathy, they're building that um, culture of care. Um, so if a workplace doesn't have a carer friendly culture, um, there is the potential um, for negative stigma, stigma to be attached to caring. Um, hopefully that's diminishing um, though, um, with these employees being seen as less dedicated, committed or career oriented, um, which we know isn't true. Um, and also, it's important um, for workplaces to have and design post helpful policy workplace supports um, and even external supports um, so that when carers are under pressure and they may think of up, and they may think about giving up work um, which while sometimes that might be necessary um, at other times you know there may be some options available um, and we'll go in and we'll talk about those um, in the next couple of slides. So this is the framework that carers and employers have in terms of um, setting out best practice and also uh, in terms of the uh, criteria organisations submit against to demonstrate um, their um, eligibility for um, accreditation. And before I go through these, um, what we say to employers is sometimes the first step in building a carer friendly workplace is to consult and understand the carer population in their workforce. So we suggest that they use staff surveys um, to monitor the nature uh, the number, the nature and needs of carers across the organisation. Um, looking at that first um, key focus area there, uh, carer recognition, um, it's really important, we say to organisations, to have a clear and consistent definition, which is based on the Carer Recognition Act, um, because often we see in organisations um, the term carer and parent used interchangeably, um, but we need to get that definition um, clear so that carers can be recognised in their own right. In terms of policies and procedures, here we're looking at those um, that are relevant to carers, such as carers leave 
and uh, the right to request flexible working arrangements, which we know are so important. So we look at whether these are um, available and easy to locate. Um, you know, better yet, is there a flexible working policy that makes flex working the norm? Um, the other, the next um, area that we look at is that capacity um, building. And I think that one, um, as well as the care and recognition are really important in that element of culture, you know, building the culture. So, you know, we look at what training and education is offered and we do have some resources of our own that we're able to um, work with organisations. Um, it's really important that managers are confident in managing staff with caring responsibilities and know how to have those conversations um, with carers. Um, the other one, the next criteria is that one on communication and awareness. So um, as well as having messages that are positive and consistent, um, we know that when messages come from leaders and throughout the organisation on a regular basis, this really helps to build a carer friendly culture. And lastly, that practical workplace support. Um, you know, we, we looked um, at organisation to provide supports that are, you know, meaningful and useful. And sometimes when organisations, um, depending on their size or their um, resources, um, they might already have an EAP and just connecting that into um, perhaps a carer's hub um, is one is one way to, to show that um, there is some workplace support there um, for carers. And other times they're more tailored specifically to carers' needs and some organisations have those, have employee network groups specifically to support carers um, or even sometimes like a quiet room perhaps um, for carers to take calls. Um, and so where I'm at, at the, where we're at at the moment is we've got six employers that have been accredited um, at level one. Um, so we've, we've got a long way to go, but we have made a good start, I feel. Um, the logo of most of the accredited employers is, is displayed uh, at the foot of the landing page of the carers and employers website. And we do give employers the right to use that um, logo um, throughout their organisation to signal that they are a carer friendly uh, employer and there's uh, and, and as there is with the three different levels there's the different logos so that's for example those employers um, that are accredited to activate level would display that logo as an accredited employer. Um, so in terms of workplace practices that some of those organisations have implemented uh, we did a webinar for carers week and it was really wonderful to hear some of the different ways in which the different organizations have implemented practices to support carers um, some of those you can see on the screen there um, I think I mentioned to do that carer hub um, where employers have a uh, an intranet page or somewhere where carers can go and um, they see that uh, definition which enables um, self-identification um, and then links to policies and procedures, um, resources, and perhaps res um, a workplace or external supports um, were some of the things that we saw that were were really um, really great to see. Um, and probably now, like just looking at wrapping up. Um, so, what would you be looking for if you were looking um, at organisations to to sort of try and work out um, their workplace culture um, and I must say, I, I think culture, whichever way you're looking at, um, whichever culture dimension you're looking at, it is hard to uh, assess, especially from the um, outside. Um, but um, I've put some suggestions up on the screen there. So looking at for those accredited carer friendly workplaces with that logo, um, obviously seeing if flexible working is mainstreamed and perhaps promoted in recruitment, um, looking to see where lived experience is valued, um, asking your networks about what it's like to work there. There might be some um, insights to be gained by hearing from people who currently might work in those organisations. Um, looking at what's uh, said and celebrated publicly, so this might be on their website uh, under who we are or our culture. And there are some organisations, uh, for example, uh, New South Wales Health has the key directions and they um, specify some um, carer supports for employees um, that have helped. We've got Sydney Local Health District, District for example, um, and in terms of having to comply with those key directions sets them up well um, for being a carer friendly workplace. Um, so that's a little summary um, of what I've very briefly talked about um, today that, um, you know, we're working with organisations to um, to have them um, think about and become aware and implement those 
those practices. So thank you, Lynette. At that point, I'll just stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Rachel. That was great. Um, I I particularly like the um, the Care Hub concept um, as as an initiative that I've seen work well. Um, you know, in in within other workplace, I guess cultural. Um, spaces that's worked really well as well, um, and and it seems quite a logical thing to to have. But I think sometimes those things that are right in front of us are actually sort of hiding in plain sight to have to dig in, and you miss the point. So I think that was um, that was a really strong point um, that that I took away. Um, the other thing I guess that I would give as feedback about. Um, the way carers are, are providing feedback in in the um, TAFE program is about more opportunities to kind of try before you apply. So, so sort of bridging the, um, yeah, I think I want to study in in this area. I think I want to formalise my my skills and knowledge in this kind of area, but I don't really know what the job is like. It's it's more that. Most of my, um, ex, you know, uh, insight comes from anecdotal evidence rather than me actually getting in and feeling, yeah, what is it like? Because it seems like that's probably a really good fit of a job, but um, I, there's there's all those sort of unknown. Uh, parts about how is it really what I think it is? Is it is it something worth investing um, my time and, and energy into? Particularly if you're going to do something like study, um, and and I just find that there's a real gap around um, the hands-on experience of the workplace. Um, you know that I think that. There's, there's a lot to be had in um, sourcing education opportunities and sourcing uh, information support, but there's actually a gap around um, how, how can you get, get some opportunity. And a lot of the feedback I get is if, if people are applying for things, it'll often say, um, you know, X amount of time frame of experience in a particular area. Now, whilst it doesn't um, necessarily say that that is paid experience, it it's often uh, cloaked as if you would have that experience outside of your home with with an organisation or an employer, rather than you know um, how how we probably all think, which is often we're actually operating a micro enterprise at home when mm. when we're um, perhaps self managing um, you know or being the plan nominee in somebody's uh, NDIS plan or or at the um, kind of other end of life. Um, you know the the my age care space and and coordinating you know either home and community or residential care and so um, that that's where I still see um, that it would be great, particularly with those carer those organisations that have already entered into the accreditation scheme that there's p potentially an opportunity um, to to perhaps put up a collaboration around who could, act, who's got cap, uh, capacity to actually be able to offer something like this um, so that carers have a chance to actually explore things um, before they kind of commit and then perhaps realise that this course isn't a good fit or um, the job role after you've been through the process and, and landed the job role really doesn't actually stack up well to, to your carer role. Yeah, that's a that's a very good um, good point, Michelle. I think um, uh, it is difficult to know, um, and as you say, when you have that investment of time, um, and I think you know a lot of um, a lot of you know a lot of um, hope towards you know building that that career. Um, it is hard to always know is that is that going to be the right role for me um, after I've made that time. So. Um, I'm not quite sure, you know, as you say, the co a collaboration is probably something along the what along the lines, and just also hearing from um, how, how do you, how do we make that, how does that happen? 
um, how do you get that insight in that day-to-day roles and I think you know probably applies more more widely you know to to lots of um, people who are thinking of entering the workforce because quite often what you think um, and what you what you see from the, from the outside and what you believe and once you actually start that role it can be it can be so different and perhaps the only other thing I would suggest is those networks where people are actually working in those roles um, might already be working in those roles um, who can share perhaps some insights into into what the role is exactly about might be the only other way it might be another way I could see about bridging that that yeah gap. like a, like mm. a mentoring I can see mm. we've got a question um, from from Simone if you're happy to to take questions without notice so I'll, I'll hand over to Simone oh. to ask a question <laughs> hello hello <laughs> oh hi hi nice to meet you Rachel hello everyone else hi Michelle mm. thanks for taking my unscripted question in my car Rachel mm-hmm. um, perfect It was very interesting to hear about the cultural change that you're going to have to make between defining a carer from a parent. And I was wondering two questions, in fact, if you could speak to that just from the communications exercise, that helps us define ourselves between carer and parent, perhaps, and how we might present ourselves to our employer or our potential employer to negotiate our rights. And the second question was, a bit more on the uh, job front, like the earlier fantastic uh, life experience. Rachel, how did you become, you know, what you are today? How did you get to be the project officer? <laughs> um, well, to go to the first question, I think um, to answer the question about the de- the um, definition, getting the sort of carers and both, you know, roles um, defined clearly for employers, um, we um, – Uh, speak to employers about the Carer Recognition Act, um, which has the definition of of a carer squarely there. And so quite often an organisation like Macquarie is one has family and carers ENG. Um, And so my thought is parents perhaps sit in in families, um, but they wanted to find a way to get the carers part separated. And so um, Westpac have now uh, got a hub and I think the resources are separate sort of for parents on the hub as to carers, um, because there are those unique challenges that come with both roles um, and while someone might be a, a parent of, of a child perhaps with disabilities it does add a sort of a greater complexity and sometimes a greater financial burden and all those sorts of things um, into that so uh, have I have I answered that question? Oh, absolutely and I hear, yeah. from, I hear from people mm. at work at Westpac that they actually mm. are quite progressive Westpac I mean mm. you can probably see from you, you had six organisations listed they're obviously all the biggies yeah, so it's it's been really it was really interesting, and I didn't have the time to really go into a lot of the different things mm. that organisations are doing. And um, and uh, my role, I gosh, I was a I was a carer when I was young. My grandmother lived with us, and I used to actually sort her medication and and it sort of help my my grandmother. And my mother has is like a a carer to so many. And my father now a carer to my my mother. So um, I I think I've always been aware of um how valuable the work that carers do is and how often unrecognised and, and how um, how little thanks sometimes carers get for the incredibly um, important work that they do. Um, and then I, I kind of got into a role where I was working with, I guess, careers and, and the two intersected and, and brought me to this role, which I'm delighted to be in now. In that case, I've got one more quick question. COVID must have flipped everything and given you a new chance to discuss the challenges of caring within the workplace when the workplace is changing to be at home. Can you speak a bit to that new development? Yes, I think we've, we've been, there's lots of, um, there has been some surveys and some research that's been done. Um, Carers New South Wales did some consultations. There's even from the UK, we were looking abroad because a lot of our our um, frameworks were developed out of sort of some of the ones that we'd seen um, grow and be successful in the UK. Um, and we've done a series of we've we've been doing a series of briefings. We've done the first one, um, and we're doing a, a second one now. But I think um, what we're saying is that um, it is the opportunity for organisations that perhaps hadn't um, been as um, open to flexible work or starting starting with a remote working that it can work. But while it can work for carers, it's not straightforward because we do see sort of added pressures sometimes um, that have come with come for carers during COVID. So I think it's really it's opened the um, it's opened the window in respect into people's lives. So I think potentially managers mm-hmm. might be learning more about their bringing when they talk about in diversity and inclusion and issues, bringing how whole selves to work. We're seeing more of that, and it's just I think now getting unpacked. And we just do hope that um, there are those there are gains to be made here, and that those gains are taken forward. And we're certainly 
um, trying to get that message out there. I think it's having those conversations and, and, and being truly flexible because remote working is one type of flexibility and, um, and it's really about um, making, you know, really having those conversations and unpacking what is possible to, to make, you know, make it work with sort of sustainability, well-being and all those sort of things, I think come into that and, and I probably won't have time. It's 11.01 now to go into all those sort of things, but it's not 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 straightforward, but definitely a, um, an opportunity and, and um, an opportunity for progress. Oh, thanks, Rachel. Maybe Michelle mm. can put me in touch with you after mm. this then, but thanks so much. Yeah. My pleasure. Lovely to, lovely to meet you and to speak with you. Great. Cheers. Um, Cheers. And Rachel did put her contact at the end of the slideshow. So um, when we um, when we distribute the the recording and the resources, as Alex is reminding me um, in the chat pod, um, I'll also make sure that you have visibility of of Rachel's um, contact. So thanks so much, Rachel, for your time today, um, okay. and and hopefully creating some awareness about. Uh, what the Carers Plus Employers uh, program is about. And, um, you know, we all are in contact with employers. Um, and for many of us, we have, um, you know, family with, with business and, and that sort of thing as well. So it's, you know, it's also for me that chance to think about, Hmm, what can the people that that I you know and the businesses I like use as as value adds um, you know in in their development capability as well so it's you know it's another opportunity to reflect on that um, I'm going to now wrap up the session today and I thank you all so much for joining us